chapter 2. You're going to keep your place there, and we're going to come back there in just a few minutes. But James chapter 2, just let me say a couple things, um, even regarding the sermon this morning. Um, with James chapter 2, I was getting a long, little long-winded this morning, but I, so I didn't go to this verse. But if you look down at James chapter 2 in context of this morning's sermon, um, looking at Proverbs 20 and verse number 6, where it says, A faithful man um, who can find, like every man proclaims his own goodness. Every man says that he is... He's great, every man says, and the words that he says are great. But, you know, the thing is that men don't act faithful, you know, in regards to um, this, um, this morning's sermon. But basically, meaning to be a faithful man, to be trustworthy, is to actually do the things that you say you're going to do, which is a big context of the book of James, especially James chapter 1, James chapter 2, talking about actually doing um, what you say. In verse number 12, he says, So speak ye, and so do. What that means is, like, when you say you're going to do something, you should do it. It's like, do the things that you say. And then James chapter 2 um, continues from there talking about how, you know, our works, um, our religiosity as it is um, kind of um, defined in James chapter 1, um, just saying that you're religion, you're religious and being um, a religious person in your words, it doesn't profit anybody. It doesn't help anybody talking about your brother here, talking about your faith. If there's not works with it, you're not going to be profitable to anybody. All right. So that's just kind of more on top of um, this morning's sermon. But this, this evening we're talking about salvation roadblocks, salvation roadblocks. So we talked about workspace salvation. Um, I'm kind of going through these on the things that you'll see the most when you're out soul winning and kind of going down the list um, as it, you know, so as we do more and more of these sermons, um, you'll see less and less of these particular things. But tonight you will see uh, you go soul winning long enough, you won't have to go soul winning that long to see this one as well. We talked first about workspace salvation. That is the one, the first time you go soul winning, you are going to run into that because that's what everybody believes out there. That's something people have to let go in order to be saved. They have to stop trusting in their own works and they have to trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. The next one, what do we talk about? Believing that the Bible is the Word of God. So you can't you can't get saved if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Why? We went through this last Sunday night because Jesus is the Word. <laughs> so you can't trust in the Word, or you can't trust in Jesus if you're not trusting the Word because they're one and the same. All right? Jesus is the Word become flesh. We looked at that in John chapter 1, verse number 14, and other uh, places. So that was the second one that we looked at. You're going to run into people that have been confused. Uh, look, and rightly so. I mean, this is why we're doing this sermon series, is so when we run into these people that are confused about these things, look, there's, a, there's, a, there's 60, 60 different Bibles in the English language that all say different things. Do you blame somebody that doesn't know that you know, one of them is not, that one of them is true and the others aren't? I mean, do you blame somebody that's confused by that? When you say, well, the Bible is the perfect word of God, what are you talking about? They, there's all these different Bibles, they all say different things. How can it all be the same, you know, perfect word of God? This is why we're King James only. So you'll run into that. We're doing this series so we can help these people. So we can help these people that want to know the truth, that are confused on these things. Turn to Romans chapter 3. You're going to keep your place in James chapter 2. So what's the next one? What's the next one? What we're going to talk about tonight, and of course, all of these things are subsets of, you know, not believing the Bible. We were specifically looking at, you know, not believing that the Bible is God's word, that it wasn't written by man, but all of these are subsets of that. But tonight I want to talk about the person, the person that you talk to at the door, that doesn't believe, go to Romans chapter 3 and look at verse number 10. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, the Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Tonight, we're going to talk about the person that doesn't believe they deserve to go to hell. If you go soul winning for, you won't have to go soul winning for, for that long to meet this person. All right, now look, Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10 says that there's none righteous. In Romans chapter 3, um, later on, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're not going to meet that many people that won't admit that they're sinners. I mean, that's a rarity. Look, you will meet that person. And that's, I mean, that's an entertaining experience in itself to meet the person that literally thinks that they're perfect. I mean, you will run into this person if you go soul winning long enough. But that's really kind of a, that's kind of a needle in a haystack. Why is that? 
All right, why is it a needle in a haystack? Turn to Romans chapter 2 and verse 15. I often talk about Romans chapter 2 and verse number 15. Um, let's just turn there and let's just look at it. Most people are going to know that they're sinners. You are not going to have to, when you read Romans 3, 10 to people, there is none righteous, no, not one. Most people are going to agree with you, yes, I'm not perfect. Like 99.9% .9 of people that are not saved are going to freely admit to you that they are not perfect and that they are sinners. This is an easy one. So they're not saved. They don't even believe the Bible, what? but they're still going to know that they're sinners. Why? How is that? Isn't that amazing? I mean, some people, you'll run into people that, that don't go to church. They, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. They, they think that, you know, if you're good, you're going to go to, they'll have everything wrong, but they will know that they are sinners. They will know that they have made mistakes in their life, that they are not perfect. How is that? How would they know that? Here's how they know. Look at verse number four. Actually, let's go to verse 14. I quote this all the time, or I reference this concept all the time. The reason that people know that they're sinners is because everybody started with this. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, for when the Gentiles. So Paul, Paul is talking about, you know, bringing the gospel um, to the Gentiles. We're seeing this in, Acts, in, the, in the study of Acts. We're seeing the Jews get the gospel. The Jews reject the gospel. The gospel goes to the Gentiles and the, and the Gentiles, many of them are accepting the gospel. But Paul is explaining here that the Gentiles had something. Look at verse 14. It says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law. So what was the advantage of the Jew? In Romans, the, what, what, what advantage hath the Jew? The Bible says, they had the oracles of God. They had the law. So they had the Bible. All right. But the Gentiles, they did not have the Bible. It says, the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. So here, they, they didn't have the Bible, but they knew it was wrong to murder. They knew it was wrong to steal other people's things. If you looked at their laws of their societies, they had laws against stealing, against killing, against all these different things. All right? But look at verse, it says, They do by nature the things contained in the law. How is this possible? These having not the law are a law unto themselves. Look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience. Also bearing witness... And their thoughts, the mean, while, while accusing or else excusing one another. Who wrote the law in their hearts? God. God wrote the law in every man's heart. This is what the Bible is saying here. So the Bible is saying that every man, this is, what is it called? It's called your conscience. And God gave every man a conscience. Whether they know the Bible, they believe the Bible or not, Every man has a conscience. Now, the conscience can be seared. It can be scarred. It can be, you know, this is where you get psychopaths and all this unnatural things and all this stuff, right? But that's not the, the topic of tonight's sermon. But the point is, this is how people know they're sinners. Because God wrote the law in their heart. So you're not going to run into uh, a lot of people out there that don't admit that they're sinners, all right? I did meet one man one time giving the gospel um, in church at Verity. Um, he was a visitor, and we very much the same as we do here. Um, we had personal workers. I was a personal worker. Visitor came. I sat down with him, and I gave him the, I was giving him the gospel. We asked him. Um, we always try to get everybody saved that comes to church here. We did the same um, at Verity. I sat down with him, and I started right out with uh, Romans um, Romans chapter 3, as we always do, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. And, you know, I, I asked him, you know, hey, you know, you're not perfect, right? And he's like, no, I am, actually. I don't sin. I used to, but I don't anymore. And, you know, at that point, you know, we're done here, right? He's like, you know, I, I was trying to explain to him from the Bible that, you know, everyone's a sinner. We've all sinned. You know, there's plenty of verses on this in the Bible. And he's saying, are you telling me that the pastor of this church is a sinner? And I was like, yeah. He's like, that's crazy. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay, anyway. But the point is, is you're not going to run into that many people. I can count people that I've run into that say that they're not sinners on, I think, probably on one hand. It's a very rare thing. But you will run into people. You will run into people that you can explain hell, you can explain the second death, you can explain, you know, the wages of our sin and that spiritual death. You can explain that. And there's people that think, yes, I'm a sinner, but I don't deserve that. You will meet these people. 
You know, this is a fairly common thing to run into. And this is also, you know, the importance of recapping with people. Because many times, you'll go and you'll go through the gospel and you'll talk about being sinners and the wages of sin and the, the penalty of hell. And then you'll go back into the gift of salvation and then you'll go and recap with people and you're like, so you believe you're a sinner and you deserve, you go to, hell, and you deserve to go to hell. Many people will say to you, yeah, I believe I'm a sinner, but I don't, I don't think I deserve that. I don't think I deserve that. Look, this is a roadblock to salvation if people do not accept this, all right? So it's important to recap with people, first of all. You know, when we're out soul winning, we want to be thorough always. We want to be having conversations with people always. We're very thorough soul winners here. So if you're, if you're going to learn to soul win somewhere, this is the place to learn it because we're very thorough. You know, we are not giving seven-minute gospels. We're out there. We're being thorough. We're making sure people understand the simplicity of the gospel, and we're making sure that people are really getting saved out there. And it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It is the, is the first works. We're going to do it right. All right? But look, you will find these people that think that, you know, they'll agree with most things, but they just like, I don't think I'm that bad. Because look, hell's pretty bad. And you're going to explain, you're going to explain hell to people when you're out soul winning. It's going to be one of the first things. I'm a big proponent on really like getting this right, getting hell explained properly and correctly up front. Because if you can explain that correctly to somebody, you've got their attention for the next however long you need to finish the gospel. But look, it begs the question. It begs the question from the Bible, do all sins deserve hell? Right? I mean, we obviously know this answer. I mean, think about it, though. There's a lot of really nice people out there. I mean, there's people all the time. These are the people that just, it just bothers me. You go out soul winning, and you just meet a lot of really nice people. They're super nice people. You can tell they're, you know, he's a, he's a, this guy's a family man. This guy uh, loves his wife. He loves his children. You know, he just, he, he's, he probably go, maybe even goes to church. But they just don't believe. They just don't trust on Jesus or they believe in works or whatever. Does that really, during the John chapter 3, does that really, I mean, is that guy going to really go to hell? Does that guy really deserve hell? Turn to John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. This is the importance of the Bible. Look, there's a lot of really nice people out there, folks. People that you walk away from their door. They're not interested in hearing the gospel. Where I walk away and I'd be like, I, I'm, that, that guy seems like a nice guy. I, you know, that guy seems like somebody who would fit in at church, who would, who would get along with people that I get along with. There's a lot of really nice people people that you're going to meet out there. But look at John 3, 36. The Bible says, you know, what you have to just remember what sends a man to hell. What sends a man to hell? It says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It is believing on or believeth not that sends a man to hell. It is, believeth, it is he that believeth not that sends a man to hell. It's, it's not a man that is not nice. That has nothing to do with it. So that nice man, that nice man that does not believe, yes, he's going to go to hell, and yes, he deserves it. So that is what people need to understand. And it's funny because I'll give an analogy to people. People have a hard time with this. People have a hard time with this because there's too many liberal churches out there that don't preach the Bible. There's too many liberal churches that have made God something that he's not. You know, I'll tell people out there, I'll give an analogy to people out soul winning sometimes. I'll say, you know, when people think that, you know, their niceness or being good is going to get them to heaven, and I know that's, this isn't necessarily what the sermon is about tonight, but I'll just give an analogy. I'm like, you know, what if I stole that guy's car right there? I stole his car and I wrecked his car. And then I got arrested and they brought me in front of a judge. And this was a good judge. And the judge says, uh, Pastor Jared, did you steal that car? And I say, well, judge, I, I did steal the car, but I'm really nice. And every time the person that I say that to, they laugh. They laugh because they're like, no judge is just going to let you go because you're nice. You have to pay for the car. that You, you have to pay for the crime that you committed. This is the problem that we're at. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Or I'll just read Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 36 for you. You turn to James. You go back to James chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 36, this is the problem. 
Jesus says, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. This is the problem. The problem is that every sin that you've committed, you will have to give account for. And being nice can't cover up for the sins that you've done. That's it. I don't care how nice you are. The Bible says that you must, we, have, we owe a payment for our sin. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is death, but every nice thing cancels out a bad thing. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't even work that way where? The reason people laugh when I give that judge analogy about the stealing of the car is because the law written in their heart doesn't match that. They know that if you've done something wrong, it has nothing to do with some nice thing that you did over here. It just, it's apples and oranges. That's the problem. Now look at James chapter 2 and verse number 10. This is really the verse that it, you, you would use to explain to somebody that, look, unless you've kept the whole law, all right, look, if you've never sinned, like if that guy, look, that guy was a liar. Because the Bible says that nobody's, you know, perfect. Nobody has not sinned. But theoretically, if somebody had never sinned, they wouldn't be guilty. But look at James chapter 2 and verse number 10. The only person that's ever done that is Jesus. Look at James 2 and verse number 10. The Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point. This is the, this is the idea that is trying to get that God is trying to get across to us here. This guy keeps the whole law. This guy's really, really good. But then he offends in one spot. First of all, is there really anybody like that? No, there's not. All right? But look, this is, say there was. Say there was somebody that kept the whole law and yet offended in one point. He's guilty of all. Look, then in verse number 11, it explains it even further. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. So here's a guy that says, don't kill, don't commit adultery. Now, if thou commit no adultery, and he doesn't commit adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So what James chapter 2 and verse number 10 is saying is if you keep the whole law and you offend in one point, you are a transgressor of the law. That's what James 2.10 is, is, is explaining. All right? James 2.10 is saying, look, if you're going to be justified through the law, you've got to keep the whole thing, which no one can do because we are all sinners. And the law in your heart says that. That's what James 2.10 is explaining. All right, now, let me just address like some false doctrine that people will use James 2.10 to come up with. And this is a huge false doctrine today, and it needs to be shut down. It's this doctrine of all sin is equal. This doctrine that, that churches today teach that all sin is equal, so whenever somebody does some wicked, horrible thing, it's just like, oh, we're all sinners. All sin is equal. They'll use James chapter 2 in verse number 10. But is that what the Bible said in James chapter 2 and verse number 10? Did, did James chapter 2 and verse number 10 say all sin is equal? No, James chapter 2 and verse number 10. And again, if you ever like read a verse in the Bible or somebody's reading a verse in the Bible and they're coming up with some wicked false doctrine to it, basically all you really have to do most of the time is read a verse before and a verse after. In this case, it's the verse after. What James chapter 2 and verse number 10 is saying is that if you keep the whole law and you offend in one point, you are a transgressor of the law. That is what it is saying. All sin is equal is easily proven false from the Bible. Let's take a few minutes and just look at this. First of all, that's not what James 2.10 said. But it's saying, turn to Matthew chapter 23. Let's look at a couple of things. All it's saying is if you offend in one place, or if you say, keep the whole law, then he uses the example of adultery and murder, and you, you know, so the guy that, in verse number 11, he's saying, don't kill, don't commit adultery, and he keeps one of them. He's like 50% on the law. He's one out of two on the law. The Bible says he's guilty. He's a transgressor of the law. Not all sin is equal. That has nothing to do with what James chapter 2 is teaching. James chapter 2 is probably the, the chapter in the Bible that people pull the most false doctrine uh, today that I've, that I've seen uh, from. They, they pull works-based salvation from this, and then this wicked doctrine of all sin is equal. This is an evil false doctrine today, and I'm going to explain to you why. First of all, does it match your conscience? Does it match the law written in your heart that somebody who murdered 50 people should have the same uh, punishment as someone that stole a paperclip from work? It's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's laughable, but this is what churches are teaching today. 
This is what churches are teaching today. You say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal, Pastor? Why are you making such a big deal out of it? Because it is a wicked person that would try to tell you that murdering people is the same as stealing a paperclip. It's somebody that's a wicked person that's trying to equate themselves with normal people. And it's, it's an evil thing. It's trying to creep into churches. This, it'll let evil creep into churches. I'll explain to you on that in a few minutes. Look at Matthew 23 and look at verse 13. So, I mean, is it true? Let's just look at the Bible. It's easy to prove this one false. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Um, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees here. He says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Neither you go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. He's saying, he's, you know, he's, he's rebuking them harshly. He's like, you are the leaders. Now, this, this should wake us up as men, too, as, as the spiritual leaders of our families. He's, he's rebuking these, these false prophets that aren't believing in him, and he's saying, you're the leaders. He's like, not only are you wicked, you're stopping other people. You're stopping other people from knowing the truth. He's just rebuking them harshly. Just like the, the sorcerer in Acts uh, chapter 14, you know, that was trying to stop the, the, the governor of, of Cyprus from, from hearing the gospel. That's why, that's why Paul, for that sorcerer, he said to him, he's like, you're a child of the devil, he called him. Because he was trying to stop somebody from getting saved. Jesus is rebuking harshly the Pharisees for largely the same reason here. They're false prophets and they're literally stopping people from getting saved. Because they're the leaders. They have, they have the ability to influence people, and they're influencing people for evil. So look what he says to them. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 14, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. He's like, they're stealing, they're taking people's money. They're just like using this influence to just rob people. And for pretense, make long prayer. They're trying to make themselves look spiritual. He says, therefore, he's like, because of this, Ye, and now he's talking to more than one of them. He's talking to a bunch of these guys. He says, therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. I mean, that, that's a huge phrase right there. He says, he says, you are going to, and look, he, he says greater damnation. He's not talking about something that's going to happen to them on this earth. He's talking about something that's going to happen to them. Where's damnation happen? It happens in hell. So Jesus here is teaching, is, the Bible is teaching that there's a greater damnation. All right, there's a greater damnation for people that do more wicked things. And look, that, that, that makes sense to us. That makes sense to our conscience. And look, that'll make sense to people at the door, too. People that are wondering, oh, you know, is, you know, it'll make sense to people that there's a greater punishment in the afterlife, depending on how wicked people were. All right, turn to 1 John chapter 5. Actually, um, go to Luke chapter 12. I mean, this is all over the Bible. Let's just look at a few verses about it. This isn't just one place. Look at Luke chapter 12. Look at verse number 47. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. So obviously, you look at somebody throughout history, you know, the nice guy, the nice guy that you met soul winning last Saturday, that, you know, he, he dies not believing in Jesus, but, you know, he, was, he thought he was a good man and all this, and he was living a decent life. Obviously, he's not going to have the same, same damnation that, you know, Joseph Stalin is or Hitler, or whatever, people that killed literally millions of people. Like, obviously, there's a greater damnation for these people. And you know what? That makes sense to us. That makes sense. That matches our conscience. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 47. The Bible says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So here's somebody who does something wrong, and the master is going to punish him greatly. Then look at verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So this has, you know, you could compare this to Paul. You could compare this to you. This is, <laughs> this is the downside of being in a Bible-preaching church. The Bible here is saying is that, you know, as God chastises his, his, uh, his children, which is us, the saved people, this is saying, look, if you know something's wrong, and look, you listen to preaching from the Bible, you read the Bible, you study the Bible, you're going to know what's wrong. And the Bible here is saying, it's like, if you know what's wrong and you do it anyway, you're going to be punished greatly by God. It's not going to take away your salvation, but you're going to be punished. There's a different punishment. This is just to show you the philosophy of God. God's philosophy. Look, it's fair. It's fair. Okay, turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Even the civil law 
even the civil law to govern the children of Israel, it didn't just have one punishment for everything. I mean, it wasn't like anything that happened is just like, execute him. <laughs> I mean, it just, there was, there was different punishments from the Lord. It just shows you the philosophy of God here. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 16. The Bible says, if any man see his brother, we're talking about, um, you know, civil law, you know, a brother in Christ. See, see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. So we have a sin that is not unto death. All right. He shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And then look what it says. It says, there is a sin unto death. I do, not, I do not say that he shall pray for it. The only point I want to make here is there are sins that are not unto death and there are sins that are unto death. In the Old Testament, in the civil law of you know, the book of Leviticus, the book of Exodus, you had, you had laws, you had uh, sins like adultery, murder, rape, sodomy, you know, men stealing. Men stealing would be, you know, the equivalent of, of kidnapping. Or men stealing would be the equivalent of like the, the slavery of, you know, of early America. That was men stealing. You're going over and you're just like stealing people. Look, those are all capital offenses. Those are all capital offenses in the Bible. But then you had others, like in Exodus chapter 22, you have all the property laws. You have all the property laws, like if, if, if you steal an ox from somebody, you have to pay him back five oxes. If you steal a sheep from somebody, you have to pay him back four sheep. You know, obviously, you know, sheep are less valued in the, in the Bible for some weird reason. I don't know why. But anyway, um, if you trespass, like if you sue somebody in Exodus chapter 22, if you sue somebody and it's like, it's like a false, it's like a false uh, accusation, you pay double. You pay double to that person that, you know, you were trying to get money from. If you light a fire somewhere, if you start a fire like arson, like the Bible covers all these de details. Just imagine this. If you go and you, you light a fire somewhere and you burn up a bunch of property, you have to pay for all that. You have to pay restitution, the Bible says, for that. So there's all these different levels of punishment for different crimes in the Bible. There's sins unto death. There's sins not unto death. Turn to Psalm chapter 86. Look, and if you can't pay, if you can't pay, say I go and I, I steal a bunch of, of oxen, uh, from, you know, Brother Alex or, or whatever. I, I go, I steal his ox, and then and he's like, you owe me five ox, and I'm like, I, I, I can't pay. I don't have anything. Then I'm, I'm, then I'm sold into servitude. That is not men stealing. That is me, like, having to go work off my debt. That's what the Bible teaches about that, because that's the thing. That's the thing that the Bible is super fair about. You don't have nothing to repay somebody. You always have your labor. You can always work that debt off, and work that payment. Just imagine if we had that today. Just imagine if we had that where somebody stole something from Home Depot. I mean, think about it. People just steal everything today. I mean, if you're like, close your eyes for five seconds, people will steal like the shirt right off your back. But they're just stealing everything. Imagine if in Fresno, somebody walked into Home Depot and stole $100 worth of stuff, and they had to, they had to pay back $400. Like, you think, you think stealing would go on for very long? Well, I don't have any money. Well, you, now you have to work. Now you have to work for the city cleaning up garbage for, you know, 40 hours. And we'll pay, you know, $10 an hour and you'll have that debt paid back. Man, you would have no theft anymore. And, and, you know, God's law is perfect, folks. But the point is, the point is that there's different punishments for different crimes. Okay? So it makes sense that there would be, you know, different levels of damnation as well. All right, look at Psalm chapter 86 and verse 13. The Bible even talks about a lower hell. For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul. Now, this is a man, this is, uh, you know, David being humble, right? We know David's not going to hell, but David's like, if I went to hell, he's like, I, he, David's kind of telling you what he feels like he deserves here. He's like, I feel like, because look, we all deserve hell. And David's being very humble where the psalmist says, for great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So David is saying, I mean, it's such a great verse, because what David is saying is he's like, God, you're so merciful to me. Why? He's like, because not only does David think he deserves hell, he's like, I deserve the lowest hell. He's like, I am the, I am the cheapest of sinners. He's like, I am, I am just a, uh, you know, I'm a terrible sinner, is what David is saying here. So even David, even people in the Old Testament knew that there was a lower level of hell. All right, so look. The point is, is 
beware of this false doctrine. I mean, you will hear Christians, like, repeat this. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if you could be a Christian that knows much about the Bible and repeat this, but I remember as a, as a Lutheran being told this all the time. All right, but look, beware of people teaching this because, look, it's an evil person. It's an e it comes from an evil place. It comes from an evil place. It's trying to justify evil people, right? It's trying to justify evil things. This is how you end up with churches full of, like, people that have, like, you know, offended against children. You know, this is how you end up with, with child molesters in a church. I've heard stories of, of, of children being hurt in churches and the people still being in the church because, because this doctrine was used. Well, are, are you perfect, brother? Are you perfect? Like, like they just made, like all sin is just equal. And like there's not natural and unnatural things. All right, so this is the importance of just knowing that all sin is not equal in the eyes of God. Yes, it is true that one sin is enough to condemn a man to hell, but all sin is not equal. The Bible does not teach anything close to that, all right? One sin is enough. James 2.10 is just saying one sin is enough to make you a transgressor of the law and deserving of hell. That's it, okay? Turn to Luke chapter 16. Turn to Luke chapter 16. So you say, how bad will it be? How bad will it be? How bad will hell be for the nice guy, you know, that just doesn't believe, okay? How bad will it be? I mean, the, the words that the Bible uses, I mean, phrases the Bible uses to describe hell is like the fire that shall never be quenched. You know, it's like, you know, tormented day and night forever. You know, everlasting chains, hell is called. I mean, these are some pretty, you know, no, how about this one? No rest, day or night. I mean, it sounds really, really bad, no matter what level you're at, all right? But look at Luke chapter 16, verse number 22. Say, how, how bad will it be? Look at verse 22 of Luke 16. Of course, this is talking about the man who went to hell, the rich man who he died and he opened his eyes. When do you go to hell? As soon as you die, immediately you will wake up in hell for the unbeliever. Verse number 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in the next verse, and in hell he lift up his eyes, and he's checking in, and he's at the gates of hell, and he's like, they're asking if, no, like right away, look at this. Right away, being in torments. Imagine this, you die, you die, and right away, I have to believe that people that are not saved, that still have the law written in their hearts, right before they die, I have to believe that they're terrified. I have to believe that they're terrified because what is coming in literally seconds after they die is they're going to lift up their eyes and they're going to be in hell. And immediately they're going to be in torments. This is the person, I mean, this is how close these people are to torments when, when the unsaved is about to die. You think we should go soul winning? And then look, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So he could see the people in heaven. That's got to make it even worse. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am what? I am tormented in this flame. So look, here's the thing. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. I don't know, guess what, I don't know, and nobody in here, hopefully, is going to ever know how bad the upper versus the lower is going to be, because we're not going to hell. But, here's what I know, there's no doors. When you're there, Abraham goes off to explain to him, you're there, there's nothing we can do for you, you're there, you can't come out, ever. Just that thought alone is scary. No matter how bad it is, that, that upper level or that lower level is forever. It's for eternity. It, it's a very scary thing. And look, if you get people to realize this, you do a good job of, of realizing that, that they do deserve hell and that this is what hell is, you will have their attention for as long as you need it when you're at the door. This is why we need to thoroughly explain this. If they have questions, you need to thoroughly explain James 2.10. One sin 
and they will know it's not just one sin. One sin makes you a transgressor of the law, and you deserve this. So you say, why does it matter for salvation? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Most of you probably have this memorized. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Because, I mean, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty simple, um, logical exercise. You say, why does it matter, you know, for salvation? The reason it matters for salvation, because if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, probably the most powerful verse that you could use out soul winning is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace are ye saved. Saved from what? If you don't believe you deserve to go to hell, what are you saved from? You can't be saved if you don't think you need to be saved. It's like trying to convince somebody to put a parachute on when they're not in an airplane. It's like going into somebody's living room when they're on their couch saying, put this parachute on. Hey, it's really unsafe on your couch there. Please put this parachute on in case you fall off your couch. They're going to be like, get out of here, man. What are you talking about? People have to believe they're in an airplane and the airplane's going down. That's why they need to believe that they deserve hell. Otherwise, I mean, look, I mean, if they didn't deserve hell, what was the point of, what's the point of everything? Why would God send his son to go through all this, to die for us, raise him again from the dead, if there's no need to save us from anything? Why would Jesus' soul go to hell? I mean, why did these things happen if we don't deserve hell? Look, folks, here, here's the thing you need to understand. Hell only seems harsh. Hell only seems harsh because of this, this flavor of Christianity that has, been, that has been spread throughout America especially. This Christianity we talked about this morning a little bit, this long-haired Jesus, there's no judgment, there's just like Jesus has got long hair, he's wearing a dress, he's effeminate, he's carrying a sheep around. There's no, don't judge, don't ever judge anybody, which is the stupidest statement ever. That may, basically means like, don't ever decide right from wrong. What in the world? People judge every single day of their life, every single moment of their life, they make judgments. When you drive in your car, you make a judgment. When their light goes green, you make a judgment. Like, it's green now, I'm going to go. That's a judgment. Judgment is part of life. There's just righteous judgment, and there's unrighteous judgment. The Bible is very clear about this. But this, this liberal Christianity today is, look, you could even have a church that has the right gospel that's doing damage to people by, by just not teaching the judgment of God, by not going out and soul winning and telling people that hell's a real thing. They never preach about hell. They never talk about hell. They never, I mean, they just skip over those parts of the Bible. That's pretty negative. Look, if you're going to skip over the negative and the wrath and the judgment in the Bible, you're going to not read much of the Bible because it's all over the Bible. Why do you think Jesus talked about hell so much? Why was Jesus constantly talking about hell? The real Jesus, the red words in the Bible talk about hell and judgment ten times more than they talk about anything else. Why? Because it's a warning. Because God doesn't want people to go to hell. Jesus didn't want people to go to hell. It's a real thing. It's not plastic. It's not made up. It's, again, it's literal. Why we must read the Bible for what it's telling us. We can't be these people that are like, oh, well, you know, this is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're like, oh, yeah, that's, they've made up their own God. And they just, yeah, that's, that wasn't literal. What in the world are you talking about? The Bible talks so much about judgment, about eternal judgment, about damnation, about greater damnation. It's a very serious thing. Everyone deserves hell. You and I, as we sit here saved, we deserved hell. And the only reason that we are not going to go to hell is because the blood of Jesus Christ is covering us. That's why. The only difference, so see, look, everybody deserves hell. The only difference is that some people are going to realize that punishment. And, and it's a scary thing. And that's why 
we need to just always have a heart for the lost because this is a this is a real thing that's going to happen to a lot of people. Garrett did a sermon a couple years ago about how many people die every minute. And just thinking about if the vast majority of those people are saved, how many people are going to hell every minute of every day? And that's why people need to realize that they deserve hell. Because then, when they realize the punishment that they deserve, because of what they did, it's not a, it's not a mean God. It's they deserve the punishment because of what they did because of their sin that they know they've committed. Why do they know they've committed it? Because God gave them that knowledge. That's why. God gave them that gift for free in their heart to know that they have done God wrong. And that should be enough to drive them to the Savior. And then through us, we go out, we tell them the truth, and game, set, match. So we have to get people to realize this. Otherwise, save from what? James 2.10. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.